Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Thank you for being here. You're attending Are You Being Greenwashed? Separating Fact from Fiction and Environmental Oriented Claims. Terms that describe degrading products such as biodegradable, compostable, recyclable, and, and others are used more and more in product marketing these days. Oftentimes, consumers misinterpret the terms as being synonymous. Other times, they are intentionally misled into that perception. Such are the problems with greenwashing, a term we'll explore in greater detail during the course of this webinar. Whether you're a product manufacturer in retail sales or are part of the commercial or municipal waste management industries, greenwashing is hurting your bottom line. Today, you'll hear from a panel of experts in these areas to explain how and, more importantly, what you can do to see through the smoke screen and get past the double talk. Joining us today are four people who are leaders in the two premier organizations active in this space in the United States, the Biodegradable Products Institute and the U.S. Composting Council. Rhodes Yepsen is Executive Director of BPI, leading certification organization for products in North America. Previously, Epson was a volunteer on the boards of BPI and USCC. He was in marketing within the bioplastics sector and was also an editor at BioCycle magazine. Susan Toman, the Vice President for Corporate Development of Cedar Grove, leading environmental solutions company in the Seattle area, and a globally recognized name in urban composting. In 2009, Susan initiated a Brown Mark Food Service packaging program nationally with 13 manufacturers. She is also on the board of USCC. Sarah Martinez is Sustainability Manager for Eco Products, leading compostable food service packaging brand. Her duties include ensuring environmental and social responsibilities are high priority eco products, product design, supply chain, customer relationships, operations, and beyond. Previously, Sarah was Sustainability Manager for the retailer Target. Sarah is on the board of the USCC and also serves as Vice Chair of the Colorado Com Council. And finally, Joe Lample, creator, host, and executive producer of the award-winning national PBS series, Growing a Greener World. And he's founder of JoeGardner.com. He's also the previous host of Fresh from the Garden on the DIY, DIY Network, as well as on-air contributor to the Today Show, Good Morning America, and the Weather Channel. Joe often serves as an official spokesperson for the U.S. Composting Council. Thank everyone for attending. Here's our agenda for the next hour or so. We've allowed 40 minutes for our panelists to make their presentations. We've also reserved some time at the end for presentations. and. Um, some Q&A, so we'll get to as many questions as we can, time permitting. There will also be a participant survey sent to you after the webinar, and we'd appreciate hearing your feedback from today's program. Before we get into the agenda, here are a few housekeeping items. First, if you, you don't have to make detailed notes or worry if you miss a point made by a panelist, the link you received when you registered for this webinar will serve as your link to the archive of today's presentation. And that link should be good uh, for a minimum of at least a month and probably longer. Next, you'll have the opportunities to bring up a question if you like. You can simply type it, type it into the appropriate field on your computer screen. We'll compile the questions here and get to as many uh, as possible at the end of the presentations. Some of the questions you come up with may actually be answered by uh, presenters. So. We'll try to uh, manage that here on this end. And finally, remember the purpose of today's uh, webinar is not to dispense legal advice. Our discussion involves the greenwashing issue, especially as it affects consumer packaged goods, but it's not focused on a specific marketing campaign or a brand. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, if you're looking for legal advice on greenwashing, then your webinar. But it will have very interesting conversations and presentations. And in the interest of uh, full disclosure, this webinar is being presented by Massimo Zanetti Beverage, makers of fine coffee brands such as Kauai Coffee, Hills Brothers, and Chock Full of Nuts. 
MZB brands are now available in PurePod 100 brew pods, which are certified 100% compostable by the Biodegradable Products Institute, BPI. The company also provides an educational website, coffeecomposting.com, where visitors can find more information about the subject, can find out the composting facility nearest them, they can download for, form letters to request composting services from their city or municipality, or they can even start a petition to bring composting to their curbside at change.org. So here we are at the beginning of November, smack in the middle of the American football season. Um, and for those of you who, who watch the game, both pro and, and college, the advent of instant replay and ever more complicated rules, especially how referees interpret those rules, um, that's played a pivotal role in the outcome of many games. And referees in the black and white striped shirts are under greater scrutiny and pressure to make the right calls. The same could be said for the Federal Trade Commission in the game of environmental marketing. FTC regulators have much in common with their football counterparts when it comes to officiating the nation's marketing contests and ensuring all competitors play by the rules. The FTC playbook covering environmental claims was issued to ensure marketing claims are truthful and substantiated. Those rules, of course, are the so-called green guides. One of the problems addressed in the green guides is greenwashing, which is generally referred to the misleading claims about the eco-friendliness or the green attributes of a product, service, or process. Forms of greenwashing may vary from simply over-enthusiastic marketing copy to dubious scientific claims to outright falsehoods. Our panels today will help us understand this issue from four different but interrelated perspectives. We'll discuss the top three most misused green terms, biodegradable, compostable, and recyclable, and why their distinctions matter. When finished, we hope to illustrate how greenwashing affects retailers of all types, and eventually the consumers purchase products from your business. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Rhodes Yepsen. Uh, Rhodes, you've just returned from extensive domestic travel and uh, even an international trip speaking on the topic of certification. What did you hear on that tour? Tell us a little bit of some of the, uh, the challenges that you've heard uh, people are encountering out there and how that relates to your mission. Yeah, thanks for the introduction uh, and the overview. Um, and the, uh, the invitation to pre present at the webinar today. Uh, I just returned from an uh, international conference on biopolymers in uh, China last week, and uh, it was a really interesting conference to see um, all the interest in uh, the, the green markets of bioplastics, both bio-based products and compostable products. Um, and there are a lot of active manufacturers uh, in China who are both looking to um, help green the environment in China, as well as uh, export their products to the rest of the world, as they've done with um, other products. So it's, it was a very interesting um, few days in China. So today, uh, I'll be talking about uh, compostability claims and why certification is uh, essential to avoid greenwashing. As Kevin mentioned, I'm the executive director of the BPI. Uh, we were formed as a nonprofit in 1999 with the mission to promote the production, use, and the appropriate end of life for products that are designed to fully biodegrade in specific active environments, such as industrial composting. I know that's a mouthful, and we'll come back to certain aspects of that, um, but basically the big thing here is that uh, when you're talking about biodegradability, you need to identify a specific environment, such as industrial composting. So BPI was formed because a certification uh, based on scientific standards uh, was felt to be needed by a group of academia and industry to better identify products that were truly compostable and make verifiable claims to distinguish from um, other claims that were starting to show up about biodegradability and compostability um, back in 1999. The certification scheme uh, was based on ASTM test methods and specifications similar to European specifications already uh, that were already being used in Europe. Uh, we launched the certification in conjunction with the U.S. Composting Council, who, as you heard, uh, many of us have been or are still involved with, 
Um, and we actually referenced the compost facility operating guide in our license agreement. And the original logo had the, both the BPI's name and the U.S. Composting Council's name on it. Here you can see the historic logo where it has the certification seal, uh, the word compostable, and then the two organizations. Um, we launched this in that way to be uh, very transparent and uh, show the, the connection between the actual products and the end-of-life environment. We retired this logo about two years uh, ago, and you'll see the, the newer one in a few slides. So since 1999, BPI has grown uh, to be North America's largest certification for compostable products. There's been significant interest in this area um, in the last few years, uh, with many companies joining and a lot of new products. Um, as of today, we have over 6,000 certified products and materials in our catalog. And here you can see a screenshot of our product catalog online. Uh, in the upper right, we have a rolling count. So um, as of this morning, it was 6,125 products. Um, the, we break these into several categories, like food service items, hot and cold cups, cutlery, uh, compostable bags, and materials. And you can sort through these by company, um, as well as by uh, uh, some product types. It's not the most user-friendly website, but it has come a long way uh, where all items are listed by SKU to really help uh, both consumers, uh, purchasers, retailers, and composters um, identify whether the item they're, they're looking at is, is specifically com uh, compostable and certified. So why has there been such a, a growth in interest in compostable products? Um, there are several reasons, but uh, one of them is that uh, packaging and products are simultaneously one of the biggest barriers and the most significant solutions to the growing interest in food waste collection and processing around the world. On the one hand, products and packaging, specifically plastics, are uh, one of the biggest contamination sources for composting facilities. And on the other hand, when you design these for compostability, they become tools for diversion. So you, you're solving the contamination issue and uh, providing a, a tool for diversion when, when done correctly. And here are two recent articles from BioCycle where I still um, help out and write articles. One is a commentary sort of going over this um, barrier solution scenario, um, as well as a more recent article from August where they look at a specific, solution, uh, specific example of a, a composter and hauler um, where the compostable products are boosting food scraps diversion um, for, for their program. So making verifiable claims, and this is what the webinar today is all about. Um, why, why would you be interested in um, making verifiable claims, and what, why, what is the push here? There essentially are two uh, aspects that I see. One is market pressures, and the other is legality. So for market pressures, um, as you all know, and probably why, you're, why you've tuned into the webinar today, uh, there's a growing interest in sustainability, and that's really led companies to make a range of green claims uh, on their products on packages, whether that's about bio-based content, recyclability, uh, reduction of materials, so light weighting the bottles, safer chemicals, um, and on and on. Some of these are self-made claims uh, done by internal evaluation by the company. Others are backed by independent testing and verification. Increasingly, certifications are being used to verify these attributes uh, because consumers are coming to expect them if they're going to believe the company's claims. Uh, that's part of the nature of something when it becomes uh, from trend to mainstream. This leads us to legality, so the other uh, push for uh, making verifiable claims. As Kevin already mentioned, the Federal Trade Commission's green guides, which were updated in, in 2012, help marketers ensure that claims are true and substantiated. Uh, specifically, they highlight the need for proper identification, clear qualification, and disclosures. Uh, and this is to, for, for any type of green claim, whether it's compostability, recyclability, recycled content, renewable materials, et cetera, just like in, in the market pressures. Um, and we'll, we'll identify, we'll go into those uh, different aspects individually. Uh, besides the federal level, some states have passed more descriptive laws, like California, which has prohibited any plastic product from being labeled or marketed as biodegradable, degradable, or similar. So you might think that that's interesting, uh, considering that uh, our organization is called the Biodegradable Products Institute. Um, but really, this dives into the, the, that first issue um, in our mission statement of identifying a specific environment, a biologically active environment, where you're being dis uh, descriptive of where that biodegradation is happening. So plastic products in California can still be labeled as compostable, home compostable, or marine biodegradable, 
if they meet the appropriate ASTM standards. So these three terms are those specific biologically active environments where biodegradation happens. Bio, a generic biodegradability claim is not allowed in California and is often questioned by the Federal Trade Commission because there is no ASTM pass-fail uh, standard or a pass-fail standard uh, anywhere else in the world that I'm aware of um, or a certification for these generic uh, terms. We really need the specific environment. Um, and it's not just uh, uh, a carrot, it's also a stick. There's uh, the Federal Trade Commission and the attorney generals in California and Vermont have all filed lawsuits against companies for misleading claims around using the terms biodegradability, which is, not, which is against the law in California, as well as for misusing the term compostability uh, without the proper disclosures and qualification. So uh, here enters BPI's certification program. As mentioned, we have a third-party certification uh, for compostable products and it complies with the FTC uh, guidelines, state attorney generals, and market demands. Uh, there are a few elements of our certification program that often people ask about and uh, wonder what the acronyms mean and uh, how these different organizations are related or whether we're all one organization. There are four separate organizations uh, and entities essentially involved in our third-party certification. The first is ASTM, who sets the test methods, and the pass-fail standards. The next are labs who are independent and have to be accredited for doing the tests. The third is NSF International, who is our third-party technical reviewer. And the fourth is BPI, the certification scheme owner who sets the rules and has the certification label. So all of these are needed for the third-party certification, but each one is a separate organization. So let's go into a little bit more details. So ASTM, uh, sets the, both the test methods that are used um, that the labs are following, as well as a pass-fail um, specification. We need both of these. In this case, it's D6400 and 6868 for products that are designed to be composted in industrial-scale facilities. Applicants send their products or materials to an independent lab, that's the second one, uh, who's capable of doing the test, either by being accredited or being audited to be compliant. The test results, along with materials and products, uh, and a full formulation disclosure are there, then sent to NSF International, who is our third-party uh, technical reviewer. NSF is essentially verifying that the products and materials meet the ASTM pass-fail specification and additional requirements of BPI's program. And BPI sets the rules of certification as the scheme owner, um, specifically prohibiting additional items like carcinogens and um, making guidelines for uh, qualified claims, uh, uh, designing the logos, and setting up product catalogs, et cetera. And here you see the new BPI logo. Um, still has that certification seal like the original one, but instead of just saying compostable, we say in industrial facilities. So we're qualifying that claim. It's not just, it's not compostable in home, home uh, composting. It's industrial facilities that the ASTM test methods are for. And we also have a disclaimer. Check locally as these do not exist in many communities, not suitable for backyard composting. We look at the green guides, they want uh, clear uh, disclaimers made in close proximity to your claim. Um, and in this case, composting is, is on the rise in the U.S., but it's still not available everywhere. And finally, we added a certification number. Here it says cert sample, but there would be a number there for an actual uh, company. This helps prevent fraud as well as um, uh, links the, the actual logo back to a specific company in case there's any doubt. So what are these uh, requirements um, for ASTM? Uh, ASTM, first of all, is the American Society for the International Association for Testing and Materials, and they were founded back in 1898, so actually earlier than some of the other uh, standard-setting bodies. And all of their test methods and standards are developed via voluntary consensus. So that means that any company can join and participate actively and help shape uh, these test methods and standards. For compostable products, as I already mentioned, ASTM D6400 and 6868. These have three basic components. First is disintegration, the physical breakdown of the product. This shows that after 12 weeks, no more than 10% of a product's original uh, weight can remain after screening on a two millimeter screen. Second requirement is biodegradation or more accurately, mineralization. Um, and this, this is the, uh, where the organic carbon must be converted to CO2 when compared to a positive control. And this has to be done 
in less than 180 days. Finally, uh, the products have to be demonstrated to have no adverse impacts on the ability of compost to support plant growth. Uh, this means testing heavy metals, as well as a germination trial on two different plant species. So in conclusion, uh, market demand, uh, along with legal, legal reasons from the federal, state, and local, are all pushing for qualified uh, claims around compostability. The FTC and states really are, their, their goal is they want qualified claims so it's to not mislead consumers. Um, the term biodegradable, as mentioned before, needs to be qualified by an environment like industrial composting, home composting, marine or soil, and a time frame. Composters and municipalities uh, want these verifiable claims to ensure products will break down quickly and without negative impact or bioaccumulation. So they must be tested and verified. Uh, ASTM sets the pass-fail specifications, uh, which are essential not just referencing a test method. And BPI, as mentioned, has all of the different components to uh, build up to a third-party certification. Finally, um, BPI is adding staff to better serve our membership and trying to keep up with uh, a number of certifications. We're going to be improving that database to make it more user-friendly and uh, more searchable. Um, we're established committees for better industry collaboration. And we're also translating our documents uh, um, into Mandarin, Japanese, and French. So at the end, I will welcome your questions, and thank you, everyone. Okay, Rhodes, thank you very much for that. Uh, once again, uh, if you come back to this resource, you'll be able to uh, use uh, contact information and, e and email addresses for each of the speakers. Uh, next up is Susan Toman. You're, uh, Susan, you're involved with consumer outreach and education for one of the nation's leading environmental solutions companies. Um, you probably see the implications of greenwashing as they arrive on your doorstep. So uh, perhaps you can share a little bit of how the residual effects of greenwashing make themselves present at, at your operation. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about that. It's a big issue and a growing issue as more and more products are entering the market to solve environmental issues. Um, uh, they tend to be creating some in our in our industry, so I appreciate the opportunity to share some of our wisdom today. So composting is uh, growing in popularity uh, as a way to divert what amounts to 30 to 40 percent of food waste and other materials from the landfill, what we're shipping to the garbage now. And Cedar Grove has been working with municipal partners, residents, businesses um, to divert uh, material since 1989. Uh, the end result of our collaboration with all the stakeholders in our region uh, has been the diversion of over 7 million tons of material from the landfill. We directly collect about 90% of the commercially generated food waste in the area, so all the school systems uh, are a good portion of them. Uh, the stadiums, uh, the large uh, corporate campuses you may be familiar with that are out here in Seattle, um, we collect those, we bring them to our facility, uh, the middle picture is our facility, and a majority of the material that we create um, is created to a state uh, promulgated specification um, as well as a quality standard that is really set by our customers. So um, our business relies on creating a, a quality product that consumers will want to use and come back and reuse. Um, so our whole business model is really that we're a manufacturer of a product, just like anyone else that manufactures. We take in inputs that have value and we create a product on the back end that people want to buy. So uh, our program starts with feedstocks. That's what we call the inputs that make compost. So here's a, just a poster of the current things that we accept. Uh, we accept yard waste, yard trimmings, I should say, and uh, food scraps. Um, we also accept uh, materials that carry in valuable feedstocks. So uh, much like uh, what Rhodes alluded to, um, containers of things that contain food are what we're interested in. So you'll see on the poster of acceptable feedstocks, you know, it has been found in municipal programs that if you use a bag in a, in a kitchen bucket, um, a compostable bag that works and meets all the specifications for compostability, you tend to get more food. So 
we've always worked collaboratively with our municipal partners and uh, makers of compostable products to ensure that the proper products are vetted before we accept them. So uh, we see that as an important part of food diversion to Rhodes Point, uh, and we continue to work with uh, collaboratively with, with everyone in that uh, vein. So what happens to those feedstocks? It comes into a process that takes 50 days. It's a fully automated aerated static pile that's covered in a specially designed membrane that helps create a highly controlled and automated composting environment. Once again, uh, consistency on our product is what matters to our customers, so uh, they want it to look, feel, smell, uh, work the same way every time they buy it, just like anything else, any other product out there. So it's a highly engineered and controlled process that uh, uh, has taken you know a lot of investment and uh, uh, work to create over the years. Um, so once we put it through our 60-day process, it turns into compost, what I call the wonder mulch. So what happens to compost? Just very briefly, uh, one of the things that uh, you may not know about compost value is our lakes and streams are disrupted in the natural soil balance when we lose soil and silt and other parts of our topsoil when we develop properties and develop neighborhoods. Um, compost creates a natural filtration pro uh, material for the environment and also acts as one of the most effective erosion control uh, amendments you can use out there to protect fish habitat and waterways. We can use it at home. Uh, unlike straight mulches or wood chips or bark, um, it actually feeds your plants. Uh, slow release nutrients. It creates the right biology for your plants to be healthy and encourage earthworms and the natural state of the soil um, the way it's intended to be. Uh, we collect from the schools and ultimately bring compost back to grow food at the school for the lunchroom and it's used out in the parks um, now more and more uh, as a natural amendment um, to help bring health to the vegetation uh, in our parks. Finally, there's an emerging market for compost in uh, large developments, uh, low impact development sites where plans are actually, you know, written with compost, high, high uses of compost to meet best management practices for the low impact development designs of these communities. So, but all that is for naught if we can't create, keep the compost quality where it needs to be for people to want to use it, and we can't keep the wrong things out of the compost that, uh, heaven forbid, we should send out to someone's garden or yard. So despite all the uh, efforts and to market compost, uh, our industry's entire economic model relies on high quality standards and the performance of our products. So. Uh, we are meticulous about what we accept, uh, why we accept it, and we've really tried to mine the space and do our due diligence within our region uh, to make sure that uh, we, we, we know what to, to look out for and, and how to deal with it. So where does the issue of items coming into compost that shouldn't come from? Well, I'm a firm believer that the emotional and political desire to end these pictures <laughs> is a big driver for it. Uh, Single-use packaging, you know, continues to get bad press uh, when it shows up in fish and oceans, and uh, understandably so, um, people um, get upset and they want to find solutions for it. So composting is seen as part of that solution, um, but we're not disposal sites. We're manufacturers of quality products. So, you know, our position is that remember we want products that have value that can be converted into a valuable product and amendment that we can sell and continue to grow our business model um, and it takes collaboration and an understanding for what is going to work in a composting facility and what's not because this is what we pull out of our compost and it, it does hurt our business model and the future of building more composting markets. So we originally began taking the ASTM standards for food service packaging back in about 2004. 
Uh, with technology, though, emerging into uh, allowing for food waste to come in, the systems uh, that have been developed over the years um, run shorter and hotter, and the end result after we began taking the ASTM and BPI standards was not everything was breaking down in our composting system. So our lab is our compost pile, and we began testing products for their disintegration back in about 2004 um, and literally put the materials in the middle of our compost pile and ultimately measured uh, their disintegration levels over the 60-day process. Here's an example of what we would log into our system. Um, on the left is a cup, and there's yellow tape on it that is non-biodegradable, non-compostable. At the end of the 60-day process, all that's left is the tape. Here's another item that went into the, the field test, and this is it at the end of the 60 days, nothing but the yellow tape. Many items are on the market. They look friendly enough you think, oh, they would compost just fine. So you have a plate, looks like a paper plate. At the end of the 60 days, it's almost fully intact. So it doesn't make our acceptance list. On the left is cutlery um, that was marketed as compostable. And on the right, it looks like it tried real hard, but it simply didn't compost in our time frame. And it indicates to me that it has some level of polypropylene or plastic in it that is inhibiting it from breaking down because lots of cutlery now is designed to break down just fine. Once items are uh, approved in our field test, we have a website. Uh, you'll see the link at the end. Um, if you click on our website, you'll see something like this. And in the lower right corner um, is a brown box. It says commercially accepted compostable packaging. You click on that and up comes our list of accepted items that have been field tested at Cedar Grove. I would say of the items that met ASTM standards and were tested, uh, probably 40% actually make it through our process uh, and end up on our list. So it's a, it's a process that manufacturers um, you know, take very seriously. And in fact, some items that didn't, didn't pass years ago actually have now been formulated to work just fine. So we work, we see ourselves as partners with the manufacturing community to try and find the right materials that work in real life composting systems. So where are their challenges though on the greenwashing side? Here's an example of a foam cup and you, it's hard to see but it says right on the, on the center of the cup, show, shown to biodegrade 84.3% after 1,154 days. So it's not compostable by our standards, certainly not compostable by BPI standards, but these are the types of cups that end up on the market and confuse people into thinking they can throw them either in their home compost pile or in their green bin that comes to Cedar Grove or other composters. What's in a name? We've had lots of contamination come in from people making the assumption that if a bottle says plant bottle, it must be compostable. If it has earth in the name and it's associated with food service, it must be compostable. If it says made from potato starch or has some sort of vegetable in the name, well, gosh, that must be compostable. Um, buyer beware. Uh, marketing ploys to get you to buy something and think that it, because it's made of a vegetable, you know, it's got, it's got a home. Um, we, we encourage you to look for the certifications and the approvals of these items uh, before you buy them. In fact, there's some articles written uh, about certain products that were thought to be compostable for a long time and rather large companies discovering that they're not. Lookalikes are a big problem. In fact, Seattle just updated uh, their plastic bag ordinance to exclude anything in a retail operation, grocery, excuse me, grocery operation. Um, bags that are colored, uh, bags that are plastic and not compostable cannot be colored green or brown. Uh, if you think about all the green produce bags out there being produced now, they're associated with food. Uh, more and more green films are coming into compost streams. So on the left you have bags that are acceptable by substrate by BPI and Cedar Grove, and on the right you have an oxobiodegradable bag that is not. So 
So uh, buyer beware. Be very sure that just because it's green, um, make sure that you know whether or not it composts um, by the standards available. This is one of my favorites. Um, coffee is a wonderful feedstock for uh, composters. Uh, it's one of the best. I when I did composting growing up, uh, we always had a garden and we always composted and coffee was just the best, richest uh, input we could use. Um, so PurePod uh, has just come out this year with a 100% compostable coffee pod and it's been vetted and is on our uh, commercially accepted list, will be this week. Um, but out there are coffee pods being, oh, so there's a big yes on that one. <laughs> uh, but there are coffee pods out there being marketed as 97% biodegradable or 99% biodegradable. And, you know, it's got to be 100% if it's going to go into composting. So please, buyer beware. Look out for those items that claim to be partially compostable or give a percentage below 100 uh, in most cases, those are not, uh, if not all cases, those are not good candidates for composting programs. Finally, a lack of marking. If you have a PET cup or a compostable PLA cup, people can't tell the difference. Uh, U.S. Composting Council has come out with labeling and marking guides that recognize brown and green and uh, other markings as uh, certain ways we can distinguish products from each other, but we really need the support of the packaging community to help us really, um, you know, get this imprinted on the public. Uh, here's an example of color marking programs we've collaborated on to, you know, again, create a certain look and feel to products uh, in the compostable field that, that make them somewhat different in terms of distinction. So finally, what happens when the wrong things come through in composting? It adds costs. We're manufacturers. If you slow the process down, cost us money, hurts our programs, rate, we have to raise our rates. We lose a lot of good feedstocks um, to plastic entrainment and the wrong things getting mixed in. Uh, we have to reject loads, which doesn't make anyone happy and ultimately costs us all not just the money it takes to take it to the landfill, but the emissions to carry it away somewhere else after we spend all this time trying to do the right thing environmentally. Um, you know, when we can't get everything out, we have upset customers and the very end of the day, crabby composters. So uh, with that, we appreciate, uh, I appreciate your listening to Cedar Grove today and being asked to be part of this. And there is my email address and our website address. Uh, should you want to learn more about uh, the compostable space and Cedar Grove's work. And thank you, Susan. Sarah Martinez, uh, you're up next. You're uh, formerly a sustainability manager for one of the country's largest retailers. And now your title is sustainability maven for a leading compostable and recycled content product company. Welcome, and uh, please share where, where you intersect on this uh, greenwashing issue from those various positions. Sure, thank you um, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, important conversation. I um, Another industry I've worked in is industrial real estate, and, and I've seen that in real estate, retail, and now food service packaging, greenwashing um, has been a challenge in all of those fields. Um, it's great to see an increase in the desire for environmentally preferable products and services, but unfortunately that creates the opportunity uh, for companies to exploit or, or confuse by making false or misleading claims. Um, so I'm happy to have this opportunity to, today to share my perspective specifically um, from within the food service packaging industry on um, the challenges of, of greenwashing and, and the opportunities that that can present to, to companies like Eco Products. First, just a little bit more about Eco Products. We are the largest food service packaging brand that is exclusively dedicated to environmentally preferable options. Um, we are the first to admit that the term sustainable disposables uh, sounds like an oxymoron, but the fact of the matter is that there are some instances where reusables just are not feasible. Concerts, sporting events, takeout restaurants, to name a few. 
Plus, we live in a society where convenience is just a very big part of our culture. So, um, you know, disposables aren't going away anytime soon. And so we think that when they are the best um, solution, that there has to be a better way than using virgin petroleum to make a product that's designed to be used for a short period of time um, and then get sent somewhere, um, which is why we make our products with renewable resources that are commercially compostable or uh, post-consumer recycled content. <clears throat> We're seeing a lot of uh, increase in demand for products such as ours, and I wanted to quickly go through a couple of the drivers uh, that are causing that. The first one um, is legislation. So communities have been banning foam food service packaging for years, um, which we're seeing continue. And we're also seeing an expansion into um, more types of packaging, such as rigid polystyrene, or even broader scopes, um, such as banning any packaging that's not compostable. Over 120 communities have passed some sort of packaging ban today. And then there are some communities that are going beyond a ban and mandating the use of environmentally preferable packaging. And there are more than 100 communities who have passed such mandates. Another trend um, that is, that is uh, causing increased interest in, in sustainable packaging is uh, a number of high-level reports and commitments that are really putting the challenges of wasted food and the realities of plastic into sharp focus. Um, as Rode mentioned earlier, there's obviously a strong link between the issue of wasted food and compostable packaging, because compostable packaging can help keep food scraps uh, out of landfills. So a, a couple of things to highlight here. First is the US EPA and the USDA have set a goal to reduce wasted food in the US 50% by 2030. So we have the federal government recognizing that wasted food is an, it's an economic, a social, and an environmental problem. There was a report called REFED, which stands for Redefining Food Waste Through Economics and Data. And that had input from groups like EPA, the NRDC, the World Resources Institute. And it mapped out 27 solutions for reducing wasted food 20% over the next decade. And the pollution that was uh, the solution <laughs> that was uh, identified as having the greatest potential for keeping food out of landfills was commercial composting. Um, and the last one I want to touch on is a report called The New Plastics Economy, which was commissioned by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and done by McKinsey. And it explains that globally only 10% of plastic packaging actually gets uh, recycled. And if we stay the course, w by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So these are some of the headlines that are, are really putting a spotlight on some of the environmental challenges and opportunities related to packaging. And then finally, the last trend um, is something Rhodes touched on as well, and you're seeing an increase in the number of brands and organizations that are making sustainability commitments or commitments to zero waste. Um, I apologize, this is a baseball example that has nothing to do with the World Series winning Chicago Cubs, but Eagle Products has been working with the Seattle Mariners, Safeco Field, um, to support their zero waste efforts. So when they converted to using all compostables in their baseball stadium, um, they saw their diversion of materials from the landfill almost double. So it's a great, a great success story. So with the legislative trends, government goals, industry initiatives, and zero waste commitments, the demand for environmental, environmentally preferable packaging is increasing, which is great. But like I said, it also opens the door for people <laughs> to take advantage of this. You know, anyone can slap a leaf or a globe or a tree on their packaging, and that sends the message that a product has an environmental attribute, uh, which may or may not be true. And beyond that, consumers are they're getting skeptical. You know, um, they don't necessarily know if they can trust or believe claims that companies are making about themselves. Ecolabel Index is a group um, that tracks ecolabels, um, and their, lati their latest numbers showed 465 ecolabels from around the globe. So with that much noise out there um, in the green marketing realm, it's not surprising uh, that consumers are, are certainly confused and skeptical. And so that's why it's really important for companies like Eco Products to make valid claims that are verified. Um, I think Rhodes did a great job explaining the difference um, of degradability versus compostability, so I, I won't recap that. 
Um, but I will just say that is what um, is, is really crucial for companies like EcoProducts because we want to communicate and convey that, yes, we have gone through a third-party verification process to show that our products are commercially compostable. Um, and it's, it's the, the BPI certification that gives us the confidence in saying that, and it allows us to communicate that easily to our customers. And there's so much more weight to that than if we were to just say, trust us customers, our products are compostable. It also allows us to communicate to composters like Susan that our products have passed a, a third-party test for compostability. Like she mentioned, um, that does not necessarily mean it will break down in every single compost facility. Composting is very complex, and every composter has their own technology, their own process, they're in a different climate. So um, that's, that's often the first step, uh, that then a, a composter has that assurance, and then they can go forward and determine if, it's, if our products are compatible with their system. So of course, once we've gone through that process to achieve the certification, it's important that we convey that to our, uh, to our customers and to composters. So we put the BPI uh, label on the products where it's feasible. When we have products like forks um, and straws, that's not always easy, but it is incredibly um, important. And so we do that to the extent that we can, both on the product and in the packaging that our products come in. So that was a pretty quick overview, but I wanted to make sure that Joe had enough time for his um, presentation and hopefully time for Q&A at the end. So um, I will now turn it over to him. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. appreciate that. And uh, as you said, last but certainly not least is Joe Lample. And uh, for those of us who have enjoyed his programs for years on PBS, Growing the Greener World, of course, and his uh, own online brand, JoeGardner.com. He really knows a thing or two about reaching audiences and making complex things easier to understand. Uh, certainly his audience is, uh, is probably more aware and better educated um, than the average um, person who might be entering this space. But in particular, I think they are motivated. And, and Joe, if you wouldn't mind tell, uh, telling us about how we might as a society be able to get composting and the brown bin as uh, welcomed and embraced as recycling uh, bin with the blue bin. I'd be happy to try to do that, Kevin. Thank you very much for that. And I'll be brief because I know we're pretty short on time at this point. But um, I would just give you a quick background on sort of my role in the big picture here is an environmental steward, I guess, and that is to help educate my audience as much as possible to the things that they can do. And although I'm not sure they're any smarter than the, than the rest of the world, when they start, my goal is to at least make them a little bit smarter through the resources that we provide them. And, and one of the big ones is just to champion um, the whole idea of what we can do to educate everyone on what we can do um, to lighten our footprint. So that's where this show, Growing a Greener World, that I created nine years ago came about, was just to educate people in, a, in an entertaining way, but also in a way that helped people feel like they could really be empowered to do something. So on our television show or when I speak in public, um, you know, one of the things that I try to really drive home is the point that, you know, we miss such a great opportunity to lighten our footprint when we're missing those chances to compost or recycle. And it's so easy to do um, when they have a little bit of basic information. So I always like to start off, for example, if I'm in a presentation, I'll show a slide of a, of a landfill. And a favorite question of mine is to ask the audience, what percentage of that landfill doesn't need to be there because it could be composted or recycled? And of course, I get answers all over the map. But the actual answer is approximately 65%. And, uh, you know, the rest of that, 65%, 40% of that is paper and 25% is food scraps. Now, the reason why that's important to me especially is because a lot of that can be composted. And composting is, uh, is huge for returning something back to the soil and helping 
your garden grow and all of the things that I'm all about, and I want to empower people to do that and keep it out of the landfill. But I first have to have them understand why should they care. And so the number one reason for caring about reducing the size of a landfill is because it's the number one man-made source of methane gas, which is this greenhouse gas that's roughly 20% more potent than carbon dioxide, which is the, the bad greenhouse gas that everybody talks about, yet methane is so much worse than that. So I'm trying to help people put it in terms that they can relate to and say, well, gosh, you know, and then if, if so much of it is paper and food scraps and, and that could be put into our composting bins and it could break down in a matter of weeks to where it looks like, um, well, it's undescribable because it just looks like soil. And that's, that's a picture of me there dumping shredded paper from my office into my compost bin and literally in a matter of two weeks or so, you can't recognize it as paper because it is broken down uh, in the in the presence of um, water and air and other um, carbon and carbon and nitrogen to help it break down. So, so we're keeping it out of the landfill. But typically, people don't know this and they just throw it away, or hopefully they they send it off to the recycle bin. But sadly, we know that a lot of it goes into the landfill. So my idea is to empower people with practical information to do things like this. And and, and the other one, of course, I mentioned a minute ago is food scraps. So much of that that comes out of our kitchen can go right into the compost pile. And again, in a matter of weeks to months, it breaks down and it's unrecognizable. And then it can go back into um, into our gardens or around our plants and our in our landscape beds. The same thing with leaves. That's to me. That's Mother Nature's gift to everybody in the fall. Is rather than sending them off to the landfill or even to a commercial composting bin. Gosh, that's the easiest thing just to keep it home and allow it to break down in a heap, and then add it to your own garden. And so it doesn't need to go anywhere. And and that's a big part of my message is to reduce and reuse and recycle at home. So in other words, minimize the transit of it ever leaving your house. And the best thing of all, of course, is never letting it get to your house, such as in some of the consumer products that we buy, you know, when we bring them home, like Susan mentioned, in those plastic bags from the grocery store. Well, if we refused those bags and brought our own or didn't take a bag to begin with, that waste would never even make it to our house. And so that's the first thing is refuse it, but then reduce, reuse, and recycle. But even grass clippings, all of that natural, those natural ingredients can be recycled right into our compost bin, which is for me, you know, one of the best things ever. And here's a picture of just the, the most simple of all composting systems this is at my house, and, you know, I use pallets, and I use just heaps like this, and you see the steam coming out of it. And so I am able to get my compost to a temperature up to about 150 degrees. Now, although that's very hot and hotter than probably most home composters can achieve, um, there's nothing magical about it. It's just I kind of know what to do and when to do it to get it that hot. You need it to be a little bit hotter than that to recycle some of the things that I would love or to compost, some of the things I would love to compost, like those now compostable, a commercially compostable coffee pods that Susan referenced earlier. I drink a lot of coffee, and, and they're all in those pods. And and I look forward to getting my compost up to the point that it can get hot enough to break them down there. But I do know, thankfully, that we can send those off to a commercial composting site, and they'll break down there, which is significant because in 2014, almost 10 billion of those non-compostable coffee pods went into landfills around the world, and that's a huge number. I mean, that's that's a number that's so big, it would it would uh, circle the Earth. 11 times if you lined up those pods end to end. So to the extent that we can do things like keeping those little pods out of the landfill along with other things, we can greatly reduce the amount of methane gas while at the same time hopefully keeping it at home to improve our soil and minimize the, the bad gases going into the atmosphere. So all of that right there in my compost pile, that, and anybody can do the same thing over time, you can break it down, or it will break down, into the most incredible soil amendment for your garden, and this natural, rich, earthy amendment. There's nothing better. And Susan's company and others make commercial versions of this that look the same, but this is, the, this is what I made at home. But the end game is that we're keeping it out of the landfill 
and we're returning it back to the earth. And for me, that's the name of the game. And, you know, it's not... It's not a matter of just me doing it or one other person doing it. It's a collective effort, and it's just – it's every one of us deciding that we need to do something. And composting is such a simple thing, or keeping waste out of the landfill is such a simple thing. So it is a mindset. It's adopting new habits and an approach to how you think about what's coming into your house, and then once it's there, what do you do with it? So – it is it is a slow process, unfortunately. You know, it doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen over time if collectively we're all doing our part and we're you know we're sharing our wisdom with each other. I do really think that we're moving in the right direction and it's only going to get better. So uh, I will defer back to Kevin, and you know uh, he can take it from there. Thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, uh, Joe. We really appreciate that. Um... We're, we're ready to open up the – we have a few moments for, for questions and answers. And, um, Joe, actually, since you're close to the mic, um, we just got one, a question in about methane. I don't know whether you are prepared to, to answer that, but um might want to give that a try. It's, the question is, how does methane given off from the landfill compare with the methane given off from livestock and other sources? That's a big one. The the livestock that's that's uh that's the other biggie here on earth is the methane release from livestock. So um from a man-made source, I mean, we create those landfills. So that's uh in my understanding that's the largest man-made source, but livestock, you know, this that's the other big one. And there's things that we can do about that too, but that's that goes down a whole another rabbit hole for another discussion, but that, that is the other big contributor to methane gas. Okay. Uh, Rhodes, I think we had a question earlier that had to do with uh, uh, certification for backyard composting. Yes, yeah, and I think the question had to do with uh, backyard certification and the disclaimer on the BPI logo, and whether that means it would um, not break down in a compost pile, a backyard compost pile. Um, it's a good question, and um, you know, we need to be really specific when we're making those claims. So the ASTM standards focus on industrial composting conditions. Um, does that mean that homeowners should uh, uh, be forbidden from putting it in a backyard pile? Of course not. And uh, some items will break down in a compost pile uh, at your home. As Joe mentioned, uh, you know, he's able to reach pretty high temperatures, uh, similar to an industrial facility. So he would have a pretty good chance of breaking down most of the BPI certified items. Um, but what's clear, you know, from this webinar is that it's about setting the, uh, those expectations in the right way. Um, and so you need to make sure that we're very clear in what that product was tested for. Um, there, are, uh, there is a certification for home composting in Europe. BPI has not followed uh, that path because there is no ASTM standard to reference. Um, and because uh, a lot of composters aren't able to reach those high temperatures and the, um, a lot of compostable items need those temperatures. So, yes, you might have some simple paper items that uh, break down easily, like the shredded uh, office paper, but um, compostable plastics typically need a higher heat. Okay. Uh, Sarah, uh, there is a question that came in for you. Uh, what responsibility, if any, do retailers have to protect or educate their consumers about greenwashing? It's a really important question because retailers, that's, that's the, the interface, right, between, between the brands and the consumer in a lot of ways. And so, you know, there is an important role for sure that they can play. Now, some retailers might just say, well, we don't want to play that role. We are going to put products on our shelves, and it is the brand's responsibility to um, determine what claims are right for them. So some retailers can, you know, take a hands-off approach. Personally, um, I'm excited to see more and more retailers recognize the opportunity that they have to educate consumers on these issues and to try to elevate um, the use of more meaningful environmental claims. And so you'll see some retailers have an end cap or a special section or some sort of marketing program where they, are, where they have developed some sort of screening criteria 
four brands, and so then they can say, okay, if you can check these boxes and you can verify these claims, then we will elevate the presence of your products in our stores. You know, and so then they can have their own kind of um, little area or program, you know, branding that says, hey, these these brands have met our our standards for what it means to be an environmental product in this product category. So um, I think that's a really important role that, that more and more uh, that we're seeing with in retail and that um, hopefully we see more of. Okay. Very good. Uh, Joe, there was a, a late in question for you. We could just go a moment or two here over. Uh, are there any tricks to get your home compost going? Which materials really help? Uh. That is a great question. <laughs> wow, we need to do a separate webinar on that. Um, to make a home composting system work, you basically need four components. You need green waste, which is like grass clippings and all those food scraps from in your house. You need brown waste, which is leaves and cardboard and paper and and um, small sticks. And, and by the way, the smaller you make the components going into the compost heap, the faster it will break down. So that's a tip that you can do to speed up the process. The other two things needed, air and water. So all four of those things working together and all mixed up maybe once a week when you go out there and turn it, uh, that's, those are the things that make compost happen. And to the extent that you have the proper balance of those, and you know, you don't get need to get caught up in all the details of that. Just just add your greens and your browns, your food scraps and your yard debris. Moisten it with water once a week or so, so it's like a damp sponge. And as you turn it over, that in introduces the oxygen or the air needed to help it all break down. And and that's really it. I don't want to overcomplicate it for the sake of this webinar and the, the time constraints. But if you do that and get it to a pile of about four feet high and four feet wide, that's sort of the, the perfect size, it will it will eventually break down, and it will actually break down faster than if you you didn't turn it and you didn't add water. So that's that's my quick answer to your question. There's a lot more. And honestly, I will say, if you want to learn more about that, Growing a Greener World, which is the name of the show that I have, the website is com. And if you enter compost there, it's really geared towards helping a home – a homeowner learn how to compost, you know, backyard composting. So I'll leave it there, and it is a great question. I just wish we had more time to answer it. Well, thank you, uh, panel, and thanks, everyone, for, turn, for, uh, for turning in today. Um, we really appreciate you uh, signing up for the webinar. Uh, remember, once again, that the link that you received today at registration will be your ticket to come back and, and replay the, the webinar at your uh, your leisure later on. We uh, do want to thank our sponsor, Massimo Zanetti Beverage USA, and I invite you to please visit their educational website, coffeecomposting.com, to learn more about today's subject, find a composter near you, uh, download letters, or start a petition to request composting services from your city or municipality. Um, remember that the uh, resource links uh, that you have uh, on the screen today uh, you can access um, afterwards and up to it at least a month or two months this uh, this link should be live. You can go to any one of these websites and learn out more and learn more. We certainly do invite you to uh, visit the websites of the panelists who took their time and participated today. We greatly appreciate uh, them for doing that. Uh, you can also uh, check out BPI and the U.S. Composting Council, as well as the FTC Green Guides. Um, find out more and, and stay uh, up to, to date on all the latest things that are happening on this topic. Once again, thank you for, for uh, attending today. We look forward to speaking with you maybe down the road sometime on this or another related topic. Uh, thanks again. Enjoy your day. <laughs>